angel Gabriel came to Mary and he said, God wants to have a baby with you. That would have blew your mind. The angel Gabriel then went to her fiancé and said, God wants to have a baby with your fiancé. That blew his mind. I believe the angel Gabriel is here right now. Because that angel was always dispatched to bring revelatory knowledge and information. So I just wanted you to know that before I release the kids. Get a hold of the word that comes forth, even if you're in the Sunday schools, because there's an anointing on it to understand and to enter into a fellowship with God. So the kids can be released. If you got your Bibles, I'm inviting you to turn to the book of Ephesians. Um, so on our way there, I just want you to know that there's an increasing uh, desire among pastors in the region for assistance and service uh, from our ministry. Um, we, I've just uh, been able with uh, Faith Moscato to help find a, ch a church, a new church home, new property, and then another church. We also, they're asking for um, help with websites, sound, worship, and the likes. And so there's a, a big growing need. Now, what's interesting uh, to be a part of this ministry, you have to understand that we are a sewing ministry. We are a five-fold mindset apostolic ministry. So uh, our goal is not to just populate uh, this place, but to keep sending people out and keep advancing the word of God everywhere and in every place that God sends us. And so some of it's overseas and some of it's in New York, some of it's in Pennsylvania and different places. And so we're going to keep sewing. When I start to consider right now how many people we have sewn out of here it is a heap of folks, a heap of folks. I mean, you're talking like 30 to 50 people have been sewn out to these various places and churches. And so we just thank God. We're going to keep sewing, and we encourage you to get on board with God's calling for your life so that he can uh, prepare you for whatever your part might be, whether it's being a part here or being sewn out there. We are going to keep on scattering seeds everywhere because God is good. Amen. So I want to speak to you today about trophies of his grace, that we are trophies of God's grace. And um, it was interesting to be in the prayer meeting this morning, and everybody started talking, praying about grace and peace and about the grace of God. There was a lot of prayers about God's grace and what he had achieved and what he had done. And uh, that was the very thing um, that was pressing in the spirit from God this morning. And uh, so I'd like to just get right at it and... Um, we're going to go into the book of Ephesians chapter 1, if you can join me there. And I'd like to pick up in verse 1, and it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus. Now, just a reminder, Ephesus was the place where the goddess Diana was. There was massive manufacturing plants going on there, creating um, images of Diana, and they were selling all these... Uh, religious artifacts, uh, and it was become a main source of income in that region. Paul the Apostle went in there with his team. They blew the drawers off of Diana. <laughs> and that false god was exposed and to such a degree that the workmen and the people of that city uh, stopped losing their income by selling these trinkets and things uh, for this false religious, all these idols. They, they started losing their living. And so a massive breakout of the Holy Ghost happened in that region. Churches begin to emerge. The body of Christ began to grow there. So the gospel, by the will of God, came, and the hand of God touched that place and began to break down the social, uh, the social uh, businesses that were there, which were built upon false ideas of God and of uh, idols and such. And so it says, uh, uh, grace and peace uh, from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Take note of this next verse, because Paul's writing to these people who are at Ephesus, who have overcome all these great obstacles, who have been delivered from the overwhelming, overriding religion of the day, In that region was that religion. And these are the victorious people who'd come out of that religion, who'd come into relationship with God. And he says, uh, uh, verse 3, Blessed be the God. And the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing scripture? Jesus has a God. 
and it's his father. Isn't that awesome? We have a God, and he's our father also. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing and heavenly places. I gave you this example before. I'd like to give it again. Today, Eve, it's you, so you can stand up. So the blessing literally means when God takes all of what he is and he embraces all of you. I love my daughter. <laughs> so the blessing, that's what it means, to be embraced of God so that what he has becomes available to you. Thank you. So I want you to know that it says that God has, past tense, blessed us. God embraced the church through Jesus Christ. When God embraced Jesus, he embraced you. When God embraced him, he embraced all of us. What did he embrace us with? All of what he is, he made available to the church. So I want you to know you can be busy going to conferences or prayer meetings and praying for gifts and talents and skills. You can be asking God for anointings and all kinds of things. But I don't find people in the Bible praying those prayers. I find them in the discovery mode of everything that they have been blessed with in Christ. What you're ignorant of will never be used by you. Will never, you'll never come into use of it. But when you have the veil pulled back and you begin to see really the intention of God, what his purpose was in Christ, then it inspires you to begin to enter in and lay hold of everything that God has in mind for you. So it then becomes essential that we understand what we've been blessed with. We have not been blessed with cars and houses and jobs. We have not been blessed with all the trinkets of society and things that people think is a blessing. We've been blessed with the superior things, the things of attitude, atmosphere, nature. We've been given the nature of God. We've been given access to his very nature and likeness so that as he is, so are we in this world. And so the revelation becomes the access point to participation. I tell you, Gabriel, Gabriel. <laughs> you know, that angel, when it comes, I'm telling you, it's a revelatory uh, manifestation that God wants to liberate his people from the religious trinkets of Christianity. We don't want to be hanging around the superficial activity of the kingdom of God. We want to get involved with the very nature of God so that we can be dynamically inspired to achieve his will. So he says, God, the bless, blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has, in a past tense way, blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm in Christ. So he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He hasn't just given you a little bit. He hasn't just give you a partial thing. He's blessed you with access to everything. I love the uh, Romans. It says we have access. Romans chapter 5 verse 1. We have access by faith into this grace. We have access. Access means you're not in there. Access means there's an opportunity to go in, to enter in, to participate. Most believers are tripped up along the way, and they get tangled up, whether it's in guilt or shame or sin or not feeling good enough or whatever. And so what I want to do today is help you to see the access point, how to enter, how not just to look at the access point and say, oh, that's great, we have access but how to actually enter. How do I actually get past my guilt? How do I actually get past my own sense of inferiority? How do I actually get past my own sense where I'm not good enough to literally stand before God and receive from him everything that he has laid up for me in Christ? Christ seems like a big, tall order. Holiness seems like a great big dog, like uh, if you will. If I could say that. It's like a big, huge idea. It's like, well, am I holy? Am I righteous? Do I, have a, do I have a right to be connected to God, to enter in with God? And so he says here that he has blessed us with every, in Christ Jesus, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. So I, if I just flip over real quick, a page over previously, and it says in Galatians chapter 5, and it very clearly says in verse 23, 
For the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. So what most believers do, we read that and we say, all right, this is what I got to strive for. This is how I got to act. This is I got to put down the other thing and build this up. But that's not what this scripture says. It says the fruit, the byproduct of the Spirit is these things. If you're in the Spirit, these things come. It isn't something I'm trying to become. It's not something I'm trying to put on. It's not me trying to discipline my mind so I behave. It's about me accepting by faith the fact that God has associated me in Christ and given me the Spirit so I can have the fruits of it. Most religion is defined by trying. I mean, I, if I, as I search and think about, well, what? What's the root of religion, all religion? Trying. Hope is in religion. Faith is in Christ. All religion hopes through trying that we may gain some merit and some favor with God. I want you to know there is no merit in gaining a favor in the Christian realm. You either are in Christ and are favored, or you're not. People think they're saved because God forgave them their sins. Nobody's saved because God forgave their sins. You are either in Christ, or you're not saved, even if you have received forgiveness of sins. People sometimes say, all right, I received forgiveness of sins, and they don't want to take Christ. They don't want the life. They don't want themselves to be arrested by the God who has paid the price so they could be forgiven. Do you know, in a matter of fact, God has forgiven the whole world sins. When he died, he died for everybody one time done. He doesn't come and die again. Therefore, he has made a way for the forgiveness of sins for every person. But it is the reception of God's life that saves us. He said, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us. Can you say he has blessed us? With every spiritual blessing? In Christ, just as he chose us in him before, (laughs) it says foundations of the world. That's actually a bad translation because um, the word here in the Greek is katabala, katabalo, which means the falling away. If he was going to say theomalos, his foundation, but he didn't say Theomelos. He said Katabalo. So he says he chose us. He chose us. I want to read it right. He chose us in him before the falling away of Adam. See, this is about the fall in Adam. Before Adam fell, God already chose us in him. If you're in him, you're chosen. If you're outside of him, you're called. Get in him and become a chosen one. So it's kind of like this. Um, If all my potential for children, I mean, I can have thousands of children, really. The potential is unlimited for a man. And if I said, look, I'm going to give favor to somebody, and this is who I'm going to give favor to, all my kids. Well, then it doesn't matter how many I ever have. Every single one of them is favored. So he's saying, I'm not choosing the neighbors. I'm not choosing different people. I'm choosing all those who are in me. All those who are born from me are the chosen ones. So he calls the whole world to receive Christ so they can become a family member so that they will be the chosen ones that he can pour this goodness through. This has nothing to do with your works, nothing to do with your effort, nothing to do with your discipline or how much you can memorize scripture or how much you can pray or how much you can do something. It has everything to do with the access point that is called faith 
gives me access by faith into this grace. The grace of God is God working and laboring in Christ to redeem you from what you couldn't redeem you from so that he could call you and then choose you when you come into Christ, not based on anything you've done. Hello. You know, so think about it. Sometimes just try to think about the gospel from God's perspective instead of your perspective. You think, well, am I good enough? And is this okay? Should I enter? Should I believe? Should I have faith? But look, from God's perspective, I've done all of this so you can't mess it up. See, God wants his children to have confidence in him no matter what they face in this life. People who are strong in the faith are people who have ultimate trust and confidence in the one who's done something for them. Okay, so let's read on. He says, um, just as he chose us in him before the falling away of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So some people might preach that we should be, but we're not. No, he chose us in him, holy and blameless. He didn't choose us to work it out so we can become holy and blameless. He put us in Christ, killed us in Christ, and resurrected us from the dead so that we would be holy and blameless because he had paid the price for our sins. He chose us there to be. Can you say, I need to be? I am holy. And blameless. Can you say, I'm blameless? Maybe you should tell Gabriel, I'm blameless. Maybe you should tell God, I'm blameless. Maybe you should tell the devil, I'm blameless. Until you have confidence in what God did for you, you have confidence in your own self-works, and therefore you're going to be discouraged. You're going to be challenged. Every day you walk in the presence of a holy God, based on your own works, you're finished. But every day that you walk based on the finished work of Christ, you are exalted together with him as a co-owner of the spirit realm. You've got every blessing as a part of your armament. Hallelujah. So he chose us in him before the falling away of the world. Verse 5, having, now a lot of your Bibles say predestined, bad choice of words, um, because you can read all about, and I'm not going to teach about it today, but you can go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 12, 11 and 12, and it'll teach you about the seed principle, that everything God made, he put seed inside of it. The seed inside of it governed the life of the parent, of the thing that has it. When that seed got sown, whether through animal or plant life, it always produces the exact kind of life of the parent. And, and so what the seed is, is a governor of the life of the parent. Are we together? So it says here, he has predestined us. It's actually, in the Greek, it's pre-engineered or an architectural design. So in other words, God architecturally designed us in Christ. Christ is the anointed seed of God. So the seed, it says in um, Peter wrote, and he says, we are born a second time of an incorruptible seed of heaven from God. So a seed came out of God, which guarantees it will produce the life of the one that sent it. So we think, you know, I'm just going to try to become a son of God. I'm going to work this out. No, you're either born into it or you're not a part of it. The seed guarantees your holiness. The seed guarantees your consecration from the flesh. Because the seed produces the life of the Father who sowed it into you. See, he has pre-architecturally designed us or pre-engineered us by the seed principle to be born again from heaven so that God could produce his life in us. Somebody needs to shout hallelujah. So God isn't depending on the conversion of humans. 
He is depending on the insertion of his life. Somebody, I, man, if we ever get a hold of this, I tell you, as, well, I'm going to say, as we get a hold of this, as we get a hold of this, it's going to manifest more and more because we'll stop putting such faith in our own activities and we'll start putting faith in the seed of heaven. Now, I started with a seed a lot of years ago. Wow, you think it's been a lot of years. Well, I don't have a seed there anymore. I got a tree. You understand, the Bible says that we are becoming tr oaks of righteousness. So Father God's the, he's the oak planter, seed planter, and we are the trees that have coming up. That's why it says all the trees of your field need to clap their hands. That's about us. It's about mature. So when the trees of the field are clapping your hand, that's about mature believers clapping and applauding your decision. Yeah. So if you get married to someone and no one's applauding, run. run. <laughs> Margie says run. Uh, uh, but if you're getting married and the trees of your field are going, oh, that's great. That's the mature believers, not the, just the seed babies. It's the ones who've been developing for a while. It's 11-11, praise the Lord. Wow. And so it's like God is causing growth inside of his people, and they are the ones we should be looking at for yeah. communication and applaud of what we're doing. Yeah. So I don't look to weak and baby Christians for applaud. I'm looking for the mature in Christ, those who trust God, those who put this revelation to work, those who access it by faith, not those who are striving for it, those who have it by faith. And I want to know what they have to say about what I'm doing. Because those are the trees of my field. So he has pre-engineered us <laughs> to the adoption of his sons. It's actually appointment of his sons by Jesus Christ to himself. According to the good pleasure of his will. So let me get this straight. I was in Adam in seed form. And Adam was perfectly righteous, walking with God. And then Adam decided to disobey the God who made him, and Adam stepped into sin. Therefore, all of us in seed form went with him. So then, all these children are born in that state. And then Jesus shows up, and he takes the whole human race in himself and dies on the cross to pay the price for what Adam did and all the sins of everybody so that I could step back out of sin so that I can step back into my original purpose. So I think you should get it straight. I never sinned in the first place. Adam did. And I never did anything righteous in the second place. Jesus did. And I'm shifting around like a cataclysmic movement of humanity in and out of trouble because of our fathers. And people wonder why fathers have such effect on them. <laughs> so... I didn't choose to sin, but I became one. And I didn't choose to become righteous, yet Jesus brought me back into the presence of God. This thing's less about you than you think. We walk around and go, gee, I wonder if I was good enough today. Do I qualify? You had nothing to do with it. This is about whose father you are. Who's your father? Maybe we should say, who's your daddy? <laughs> My daddy's God. You know, there might be many ways to God, but there's only one way to the Father. That's right. yeah. Yeah. yeah, come on. Do you know something? If someone in another country doesn't know Jesus Christ and they pray, God hears them. Yeah. I was talking to someone from Iraq back a couple years ago. They said she was eight years old. She was really sick. And she believed in Allah because that's what she was taught. But in her desperation, she didn't cry out to Allah. She cried out to God. She didn't know Jesus. She cried out to God. God, heal me. Boom, power of God hit her and healed her. She was like, she suddenly realized there's more than Allah. Because her internally, she was made for God. She was made for him. And something in her she didn't know was there cried out to him. 
So there might be many ways to touch God, and he'll respond. But there's only one way to the Father, and that's through the Son. So you might know God, but if you know God, you know the judge. But if you know God as Father, then you know the lover of your life and the one who wants to do something to help you. And I suggest you get off the judgment side onto the lover side so that you can get to know him. I've been saying lately, I'm going to keep saying it, that if you think God is a God of love, you only know one side of him. He's the same God who judged everybody in the Old Testament today as he was then. It's just that he found a way in Christ to redeem us out of that mess so he wouldn't have to judge us. So anybody who puts their trust in Jesus is delivered, is delivered, not someday, is delivered from all judgment. Isn't that awesome? Good news. So he pre-engineered us as sons through Jesus Christ. How? By birth of the seed, the governor, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glory. What? To the praise of his glory. Of his grace by which he has, my Bible so beat up I can't even read it anymore. He has made us acceptable in the beloved. Well, I'm trying to become acceptable. Yeah, I give up on that. I made you acceptable. When? Well, you were in Adam and then you went out into sin and then I brought Jesus and you went back into me, so it's time to give up on that whole thing. See, we think it's us. We really, we think, we make too much of this temporal short yeah. dot called our life. Yeah. This is the only age and generation by which you can learn faith, but it's not about becoming good. It's about learning faith so you can connect with your father who operates by faith. God made all things through faith. He is the God of faith, and he wants children of faith. That's why he put us in a world where we can't see him or any angels. So what? So we can learn faith. He wants us to trust him. He wants us to look to him. He wants us to go beyond the flesh, and he wants us to use faith as the way, the avenue. This whole thing from start to finish is about faith. So he says, um, to the praise of of the glory of his grace. So I want to just uh, tell you some of these Greek words here. Praise means evaluation. So when you say, hallelujah, glory to God, hallelujah, and it doesn't mean anything to you, that's called vain religion. A lot of people, they'll come up here and they'll go, well, hallelujah, hallelujah. They never thought of God once. (laughs) It's a lead-in religious cliche as you might as well be talking about Diana. I just come up and go, I don't know what to say. But um, anyway, I want to talk about, and then get to your subject. But don't vainly say things. Know what you're saying. Say it because it's real. Glory means reputation. It is an appraisal. It's like if God's glory is about everything he is. He's not hallelujah. He's God. He's faithful. He's loyal. He's consistent. He's trustworthy. That's praise. What am I doing? Defining him. So when you praise God, it shouldn't be glory to God, glory to God, hallelujah, hallelujah. That's not what God wants. God wants true praises. Praises are, you are faithful to me. You saved me. You heard my prayer and rescued my kid. When I had no job, you opened up a job. Praise has to do with evaluating him on the basis of what he has accomplished in your life. Right, So we need to learn how to praise God. We should praise him for what's real. Praise you, Father, for the buck open a day of deer season. <laughs> you know, that's real praise. Or maybe Black Friday, it's thank you for the best deal I ever got out of this stuff before. It's not about the stuff, it's about the favor. One time, Margie was believing God for a certain amount of money which was ridiculously too much. 
And uh, she was, it's, it's, this is in your favor. Yeah, she says, I serve God. And that's the way she thinks. So she's believing for this ridiculous amount of money. And uh, I remember when she said it, I was like, <laughs> so I'm learning how to, <laughs> instead of saying, where are we going to get that? Lord, where are we going to get that? You know, let's turn to him. So anyway, she's believing in spite of it all. And uh, then somebody uh, asked us to stop over out of town. We stopped there, and they went, here, Margie. He handed it right to her. Tick, dog, it's your bunny. And she went, Pah. and she started crying. Now, if you don't know Margie by now, she's not impressed by money. <laughs> she goes, I'm not crying because of the money. I'm crying because my father heard me. And I thought, you know what? It's not houses and cars and monies and breakthroughs. It's about him who provides whatever we need. And she began to praise God. On the way home, she was like, Lord, thank you. You know, she was like, oh, you're amazing. How did you get them to do that? I mean, think about what he had to do to orchestrate that, to make all of that happen. I remember that years ago, I told you one time that I was, um, was in a meeting. I wanted to give this $200 I had to this two young ladies who came preachers from South Africa, and I wanted to give it to them. And um, as the offering pass is coming around, the Lord says to me, clearly, he says, give it to so-and-so. And I was like, but Lord, I've been saving this up. I wanted to give it to them. He says, give it to so-and-so. I was like, the basket goes by. I had nothing. I, I can't tell how I felt. I was confused. So I went over to that person while the thing's going, and I says, here, I just want to give this to you. And, they're like, and I had a feeling they were going to react strongly to it, and they took it. And I went over back to my seat, and the basket's going. And I looked over, and the person was like, oh. it was 200 bucks. Now, I didn't know until later that that person was sitting there saying, Lord, I want to give these two girls something. I've never given a big gift ever in my life. Like, I'd like to give them like $200. And I went, put it right in his hand. <laughs> now, here's WB going, I want to give it to them, but, I, but God tells me to give it to him. And I'm sitting there going like, so God has to fight through our stupid to get us to cooperate so that he can get a blessing to somebody. Can you imagine that person, what they felt like in that moment when they asked for $200 that God's heard their voice in the heavenly realm and provided it? And then I watched them put it in the basket, which is where I wanted it to go, and it went to them anyway, except he got blessed on the way. Praise is the evaluation of God. He's amazing. <laughs> I just sometimes am amazed at some of the things that have happened in our lives. He says, therefore, he goes on to say, verse 6, 7, where am I? 4, 5, 6. To, to the praise, see, the evaluation of the glory. Glory is the reputation. Okay, so here's God's reputation. And praise is to evaluate his reputation. You're amazing. How did you get that stubborn Chris Grizzly to give the 200 bucks? And this guy's sitting there going, God, you're amazing. I asked for 200 bucks and you gave it to me. It's not about the money. It's not about Margie getting that money, that ridiculous amount of money. It was about the fact God heard her on high. And when we appraise the glory of God, wow. That is amazing. God gets moved. That's what God's moved. God doesn't want us worshiping him vainly. God wants us to understand him and thus respond. He's not after, yes, God, you're great. No, he wants real. He wants great that he produced in you. He wants you to feel it, to sense it. Now look, don't misunderstand me. There are times when I feel stupid and dumb and weak and tired, and I just enter and I go, Lord, I just praise you. I feel nothing. 
And I'm like, oh, I just praise you anyway. You deserve it no matter what. And my feelings are not a part of this. But I enter in, and little by little, all of a sudden, my feelings come home. And then I'm in. Now, I'm not saying to set that aside. But God wants more than vain praise. He wants real reality from your heart. Okay? So we're aiming at the reality. So he goes on to say, verse 6, to the praise or the evaluation of his glory, of his grace. How are you saved? Yeah. By grace. grace. So we're saved by grace. So it's the word cherish. It means, it means favor. So that's the, um, that is the original language definition is favor. But that's not what it means. Grace is more than favor. Grace, if you look at it contextually through the Bible, it is the master plan of God. I am what I am by the grace of God. It wasn't just him. All right, favor. Boom, hit you with a wand. Favor, favor. He's not just hitting you with a wand. He's got a plan. Grace sent Christ to the cross. Grace resurrected him from the dead. Grace sends out preachers to preach. Grace causes you to believe. Grace causes you to confess. Grace causes you to become a son. I am what I am by the grace, the master plan of God. So his favor has a master plan that comes upon us all. So I am what I am by the grace or the master plan of God, by which he has oh, made us acceptable. Okay, you are acceptable how? By the grace. You are acceptable by the grace of God. You're acceptable by the master plan. Can you all say master plan? Master plan. Okay, so here's the master plan. We have access by faith into this master plan, yeah. Yeah. into favor. And that's what God is trying to teach us. He wants us to learn about the grace of God. I want to read you a few things the Lord spoke to me. God's grace finds its reputation in our architectural design and acceptance in Christ. Say it again. God's grace finds its reputation or evaluation in our, our architectural design and acceptance in Christ. When the grace of God is successful, God finds his recognition of that in your life. Your life speaks of his success. Okay? Say another way. The highest thing grace produces is us. His kind. God's not saving fleshly beings. He's birthing sons. All right, Leon and I agree. <laughs> People say, well, in the end, isn't God going to have mercy on sinners? No, he did, and he's only accepting, only choosing those who are in Christ. Only. Therefore, let's help people get in Christ. There's no other way to God but through Jesus Christ. There is no, can you say, there is no other way. There isn't a person on an island somewhere who just didn't know, and God's going to go, come on in. No, there's a person on an island somewhere who wants to know, and then God has to cause someone to come there because he doesn't deny anybody. The same way he gets that money in the Margie's hand is the same way he gets somebody to that island because God doesn't leave any soldiers behind. He knows how to touch everybody. Don't blame God for people who are isolated. He sends missionaries into the strangest places. He sent me into the strangest places. I can't even tell you some of the situations I've been in. Walk in, there's machine guns, and people are looking at you like they want to kill you, and I'm like, oh, Jesus, this is not America. And you walk in there, you're like, whoa. So I got a video camera. I'm kind of videoing everybody going across. My brother Bob's with me. And I'm like, I'm going across, and it says on the sign, Video, people doing videos will be arrested. Oh. <laughs> Here's a guy with a machine gun sitting here looking at me. <laughs> I'm like, oh boy. Yeah. You know, we don't know their world. We don't know what it's like over there. We don't know. But God somehow motivated a weak, lily-livered American. 
You know, Americans are the least travelers in the world, practically. A lot of other nations, they travel way more than us. You know why? We like the safety of our world. And I don't blame you. <laughs> but God wants to send people out and does by the thousands. And when I got past those guys and past these other guys, and we drove about six hours through things you can't describe and went past starving people and bent, broken bodies everywhere and every kind of cultural thing that could scare you, I went, got past it all and preached the glorious gospel and people got saved. And then we laid hands on people and prayed over them, and the Holy Ghost fell, and the whole village got filled with the Holy Ghost. All of them praying in tongues. All of them. What was there 150 people in that spot there, all praying in tongues all at once? Then we went to the next place, and the Spirit fell, and a whole bunch of other people got filled with the Holy Ghost in different nations, in Thailand, in Africa, different places. Why? Because God is able to reach people wherever they are because God knows it's not his mercy that's going to save you. His mercy made a way in Christ to get you into him so he could save you. Yeah. He knows he's got to get you into Christ because there's no salvation in any other. Right. Can you say there's salvation in no other? So the highest thing grace produces, produces is us, his kind. Grace is God's master stroke on restoring and enhancing man's design. He alters us. You know, you were a sinful person, right? Well, three of you. <laughs> you, <laughs> you were a sinful person. I, well, I want to tell you, you were because you were an Adam. And so you all involuntarily became sinners. Okay, there you go. I'll help you. Uh, so, so grace is God's master stroke on restoring and enhancing man's design. So we were all sinners, and now we've all become new creations. Whoever's in Christ, if any man is in Christ, can we all say it together? If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new. Are you what you were? Even if you don't act like it. See, this is our problem. We have this finite little thought. You have a finite little thought. It says, well... I didn't do good enough. Let me tell you what, the days of your flesh don't have what it takes to defeat the grace of God. God's grace and your finite sins. <laughs> Let's read another one. Our righteousness and freedom is <laughs> can only be truly measured can be <laughs> I'm going to say it again. Our righteousness and freedom is a true measure of grace. Our righteousness and freedom is a true measure of God's grace. Not when I become better, because I have been made better. I am acceptable in the beloved. Can you say, I am acceptable in the beloved? Try it again. I am I am, I am, I am. Come on, say, I am, I am, I am. I'm not going to be. I am acceptable in the beloved. Yeah, I am acceptable in the beloved. See, if you won't say what God says about you, you won't experience what God says you could experience. And I can't even talk that good. <laughs> oh, God. He's so good. All right, Ephesians chapter 2. All right? Here it is again, just in case you can't see it, verse 1. And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Can you say, I was dead in sin? But he made you alive. Then that means you're not dead in sin anymore. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. Sons of disobedience. That means the disobedient one planted a seed inside of you of disobedience, and you were manifesting the life of your father, which is disobedience. Yeah. 
But then God in heaven planted a different seed in you, which overturned the seed of your previous father and birthed a new life in you to produce the life of God. This is about a hostile takeover. Yeah. Among whom we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts or desires of the flesh in fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, we were, were, can you say past tense, were, by nature, children of wrath, just as the others. But God, can you say, but God? You see, this is where our praise comes from. I was that way, but now, thank God, what you've done. It's amazing. I'm not becoming, I'm not evolving, I am a product of his work. Okay, so he says, I am. Right, so he says, but God who is rich in mercy, because of his great love by which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ, for by grace you have been saved. What's grace? God put me in Christ before I even knew I was a sinner. So think about it. I'm in Adam. I'm righteous. I'm in Adam. I'm a sinner. And then God puts me in Christ and makes me righteous again. All the while, I know nothing about it. Then I'm a born and I'm in sin because I won't receive the blessing that God did through Christ. So God sends preachers. They preach, and all of a sudden, boom, your heart opens up to something you never knew existed, and you're in. And you become a son of the most high God. Can I just say to you, just as nice and polite as I can, you're not going to be a part of God's kingdom. If you think you're going to heaven or however you look at it, you're not going to be a part of it unless you give your life to God. And unless you receive his life in you. There's no other way. It's impossible. There's no other way. I don't have to hang you over hell. I just have to tell you, there will be no future with God. But God, who's rich in mercy with his great love by which he loved us, even when we were dead in sins and in trespasses, made us alive together in Christ. So choose your life in Christ so that you can be a part of the alive bunch. That's up here. Okay, we have access to that. You say, I have access to that. So even when we were dead in trespasses and sin, he made us alive together in Christ, for by grace you have been saved. And raised us up to sit and sit together in heavenly places in Christ. He raised us up to sit there. In other words, where Christ is seated, I'm seated there with him. Why? Because I've been raised up together with him. Now I'm seated in heavenly places. Isn't that awesome? That in the age to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Okay, thank you, Lord, for this gift. Now I'm going to go try to earn it. This is what people are doing. All right, with, with as much humility as I can muster up about this. The, not the majority, the vast majority of the Christian world is trying to earn their salvation. The vast, vast majority. Vast, not even close. Way up there, right at the top. You can always tell. Just ask someone, who's a Christian? Are you righteous? They go, well, no, there's none righteous but him. Well, then you're out. <laughs> God, God is light, right? Yeah, right. And in him is no darkness at all. at all. And if you're darkness and you come into his presence, fried. Yeah. <laughs> the Bible says they will be cast into outer darkness. Yeah. Why? Light propels away darkness. Yeah. Don't be propelled away from him Amen. into damnation. So when we exit this world, we're supposed to wake up in his light. Now, if you're dying and you fall into a coma or something and you're in the death throes and you see a light, come back quick and come to faith because if you're seeing light, you're not in it, and that's trouble. If you see light at the end of a tunnel, that's bad. (laughs) 
that's bad. That's bad. No. When you leave here, I am light. I am in the beloved. I am acceptable. I am righteous. I am in him, by him, for him, for his grace, for his glory. And I will emerge with confidence in his light. Because I've been born of him, I am what he is, he is what I am. I'm not afraid of him because I am him in the right sense. He's God, I'm not God. But I am what he is. He's the father of my kind. We are the children of God. Quick, 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 quick. Don't slow me down. Stop it. <laughs> um, <laughs> verse 5. Verse uh, 7, that in the ages to come you might show the exceeding, the exceeding, you ought to say that word. Oh, man, the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ. Wow. How is it exceeding? He has done such a thorough work, such a flawless job that no sin can mar you or eliminate you from his hand. There's only one thing that can take you out of the hand of God. You. Nothing else. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his masterpiece. Wait a minute. Some say workmanship, some say trophy, we're trophies of his grace. His masterpiece? So here's you, you're going through life, you're going, oh, I'm not worthy of this. Man, God could talk to you and say, don't speak against my masterpiece. Why? Because you're measuring you by a moment in time rather than by the glory of eternity of what he's accomplished for you in Christ. Don't let the days of your flesh interrupt the eternity of your salvation. Did I just say that? That was brilliant. That was, uh, so, can you write that down? Gabriel, Gabriel is here, I'm telling you. For we are the masterpiece, his masterpiece in Christ Jesus. For, uh, for good work which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So let's just be straight on this. When he makes you righteous, you walk in it. You don't try to become it that you might walk in it. You start righteous. That's the only way. I've got to get to the scripture, Hebrews chapter 9, because this is like knock it out of the park stuff. Because God's Bible is bigger than our philosophies and idolatries and foolish notions of false um, false humility. I don't want false humility. False humility says I'm not good enough. That's false. God made you right in Christ. Humility is to submit to the word of God that says you're acceptable in him. So we've got to stop making excuses. And we have to stop denying the spirit realm. There's demons, there's angels, they are. Stop fearing them. They're servants of ours, and demons are under our feet. What are you afraid of? Don't be afraid of stuff. Hebrews chapter 9, <clears throat> it says, verse 11, uh, But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come. Isn't that wonderful? With a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation. Not with the blood of bulls and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for everybody, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and ashes of the of the heifer, sprinkling of the unclean, sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, 
who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your dead conscience from works. Okay, I got it. Now I'm going to go try and earn it. Now come back, come back, come back, come back, come back. No, no. He, much more than what the blood of bulls and goats could do, has purged, removed out of you a sinful nature and put his own nature inside you so that the seed can grow and an oak of righteousness can stand up and look like its father. So what happens? You know, you have a baby. And it starts off good. Oh, just look how pretty she is. Blah, poop, poop. Everything's going. And you're saying, she's beautiful. Just look at her. Oh, just clean that up. Oh, that's okay, honey. Everything's okay. But then later on, you're 14. You worthless kid. What are you thinking? Stop doing that. People start talking trash to their kid. Yeah. They speak to them based on their works instead of based on their lineage. All right, if you're going to judge your 14-year-old that way, then you got to judge your baby. You bad baby, you poop ticket. <laughs> Stop smiling at me. This isn't funny. <laughs> it's funny how at a certain class we go into judgment. But at this class, there's no judgment. Your kid will respond to the way you treat them. If you treat the church like sinners, they will act like it. But if you say, stop doing that, that's not who you are. You're the glory of Christ, and you've been made acceptable to God. Rise up, son of the most high God. We call people to a higher vision of their lives. We don't put them down because they got off track. (laughs) Okay, so I'm going to read that one verse there, 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Wow, that's amazing. Verse 23, it says, Therefore, it was necessary that the copy of the things of the heavens should be purified with the heavenly things themselves, uh, but with better sacrifices than these. So when Moses made the tabernacle, that was a copy. Jesus did not cleanse the, the tabernacle of Moses, the copy. He went into heaven and cleansed the true tabernacle. I'm, I'm pointing there. I shouldn't do that because the heavenly realm is here. It's not up there. <sighs> Thank you, Gabriel. Okay. So it's, therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy place made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself. Now, to appear in the presence of God for us. And you think you're disqualified? Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation or falling away of the world. See, there's that falling away of the world. But now, once, can you say once? Once, 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 once. once. not my second hundred thousand trillionth offering that he would once at the end of the age when's that come on my Bible scholars when's the end of the age 70 AD that's a long time ago when this was written the end of the age had not come yet because it was the end of the old covenant age which was in front of Jesus not behind him and he was saying This is going to be till the end of the age. So read it again with that in mind. The end of the old covenant age had not yet come. Remember, Peter, James, John, all the disciples, everybody were sinners under the law. None of them were saved because the blood of Jesus had not yet been spilled out in the heavenly realm to purify them. Okay? He then would have had to have suffered uh, often since the falling away of the world, 
but has now once at the end of the old covenant age, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So Jesus obtained the victory, but then there was a period of time, and that's why I love Hebrews chapter 9, verse 8, and it says, the Holy Spirit indicating that the way into the holiest of all is not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle is still standing. The first tabernacle, that temple, was still standing there until 70 A.D. So Jesus had resurrected. He had gone into the heavenly realm, and there was 40 years that he was gone until this manifestation would take place. It's very interesting because the kingdom age had to be born, which was not yet born. We could go on about that for days. Uh, as it has appeared to put away sins by the sacrifice of himself. And, and as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this comes the judgment. So Christ offered him, offered once to bear the sins of the many, to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin unto salvation. That is a clear, clear, manifest indication that in 70 AD, when Jesus did return to judge Israel and remove their place because of their rebellion and turn the kingdom over to the sons of God called the kingdom age, which we are now in. Yeah. Yeah. That's what that's about. Yeah. And he did it. And now we're in it. And now the sons of God are going, I don't feel worthy. And now the children of God are walking around, going, Lord, pray for me. I feel so condemned. Because people don't understand the consequences of the perfect work of Jesus Christ, that it's not according to your works, but it's according to his mighty grace, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus. Now, you can now see the consequences of this are so dramatic. I was once a natural man. I am a spiritual man. I was dead in sin. I'm alive in Christ. I was unworthy, unrighteous, unholy. I am worthy, righteous, and holy. I had no inheritance except in the earth. I now have an inheritance in the whole eternal spiritual realm. And none of it is because of me. All of it is because he loved me, but he did the work in Christ. And so now, how do you glorify God? With your life. With your life. But worship isn't a service you have. Worship is a life you have. So we're going to give back. We're going to give back what? Sonship, love, life, uh, nature. So what's going to come out of me? The same thing that's in my father. What does he do? He forgives everybody. Oh, I forgive everybody. Oh, he heals everybody. Oh, I heal everybody. Oh, he loves on everybody. Oh, I'm going to love on everybody. Oh, he reminds people what he did so they can escape their sins. Oh, I'm going to remind them of what he did so they can escape their sins. I'm going to be kind because he's kind. I'm going to do things this way because he does things this way. It's simple. If God is not confident, I shouldn't be confident. But if God is confident in my salvation, I should be confident in my salvation. Can you stand? Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. I wish there was time to preach. <laughs> but thank God, it's, um, it's an impartation. It's an impartation. I would suggest this. You say, all right, well, Pastor Chris, you just went through a lot of stuff there. Um, I would have to go through that very slowly and read it over and over to uh, grasp some of what you're saying. Yeah, no, I get that. Um, well, I just want to remind you, the early church didn't have a Bible. Uh, no video cameras yet, right? And the early church didn't have, like, pens, recording devices. They had a recording device. What's more important than word-for-word -word knowledge is spirit impartation. That's what is most important. Spirit impartation. Uh, now, if, if your sensors are up, you can sense the spirit by which I spoke today. Yeah. And you can see the unfolding large pictorial view. Uh, it's like a panoramic view of the kingdom of God of what happened for us. You can see that. And that is yours. It doesn't go away when you walk out the door. It's with you. It's an impartation. And Gabriel's here to help you. Yeah. Yeah. Or the other angels. 
we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, right? Okay, so we are surrounded. We're not talking about heaven. We're talking about heaven right here around us. We are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. You have come. You're not going to come. You have come to Mount Zion. If you're waiting for Zion to come out of the sky and manifest, stop waiting. Jesus said, my kingdom is not one with observation, with, with optical vision. You're never going to see it come down out of the sky. He said it's not going to happen. My kingdom is of the heart. And he said, hmm. <laughs> Tell more jokes. <laughs> oh, well. Oh. You have it. It's in you. It's in you. you. Can you say, I have the capacity to retain God's word? Hearing it once. Now, my mentor of years ago said something to me that stuck with me and it changed my life. I said, man, if you could just preach that over and over, we're going to get it. He goes, no. It's like, no. Why? He goes, one time. God deposits it in your spirit, and it's yours. And I was like, I'm never saying that again. And then I walked away. It changed the way I hear. Then when I sent a service, someone saying something, it's like, welded it in me. Because I'm not looking for evolution and human sanctification. I'm looking for eternal impartation. Now you have that today. You have that. No, I also say you've been blessed with a pen and paper and Bibles and computers and videos and everything. So we should be the most educated spiritual people that have ever hit the planet. So I suggest go back, take the recording, go back over slowly if you have to, to memorize so you can restate and minister these things to other people. That's great. But don't put off your encounter until you memorize you have the encounter. It's here. Hallelujah. Can we lift our hands? Father, we thank you for your word. And thank you for the birth of phenomenal understanding in the world today. Lord, I just ask that you would flood the minds of the people with light. And that they would be flooded with divine instruction and insight into the heavenly purpose to such a degree that they have a clear picture of your original intent of associating us in Christ, that we will no longer work for what you have labored for, that we will receive it by faith and access this great faith that you have done. Lord, thank you for the amazing grace of God, the powerful, wonderful thing that you have accomplished in Christ. We honor you. We honor you. Thank you for doing it, and thank you for announcing it to us, and thank you for helping us to walk in it. Now, Father, help us disciple the nations. Help us disciple many uh, so that many can experience the goodness of God. Father, we want people's conscience free from guilt. We want their lives forever touched by the grace of God. Thank you. Thank you.